A year ago, in April 2021, we posted a review to Pirates The Legend of the Black Buccaneer. It's been our best performing video and deserving of a follow-up. So why not go with another pirate-themed game on the PS2 with a near-identical name? Pirates The Legend of Black Cat. It might seem like these games are part of the same series, and I bet that's what the marketers of Black Buccaneer were hoping for. These are in fact completely unrelated and made by different companies. Black Cat was made by Westwood Studios. Yes, that Westwood Studios. It released on PS2 in North America on February 17, 2002. That's only nine days before another game from the same studio would hit store shelves, Command & Conquer Renegade. Turns out they released four games in the span of 15 months, and one of those was an MMO. I sure hope this high churn of releases didn't negatively impact Black Cat in any way. Legend of Black Cat is an action-adventure title that's based on real events that took place during the golden age of piracy. It's also a game where the American box art is superior to the European release, which I think is rare? At least that's what Twitter has conditioned me to think. In it, players take control of a pirate named Katarina de Leon, who sets out to avenge her father and reclaim her mother's lost treasure. Along the way, she'll fight the Crimson Guard for control of the islands and use the spoils of battle to upgrade her ship. Finding the treasure means recovering the five lost chart stones which are guarded by the island's bosses. So here's a giant enemy crab. You can flip it on its back to deal massive damage. What does all this mean? If a reference to a meme from 2006 is too old for you, I'd like to clarify this game is total fantasy and has nothing to do with historic events. There's a fire in the town. My father's life may be in danger. The governor? I'm going ashore. I'll have to make my way to town on foot. Pick me up when the tide comes in. The story for Black Cat is rather threadbare when you take into consideration its 12-hour runtime. The writers couldn't decide if they wanted a revenge tale or a coming-of-age quest to find lost treasure, so they went with both. It begins when our father is mortally wounded by a guy who absolutely nails the evil laugh. <laughs> As he bleeds out, he writes a letter telling us our deceased mother was a pirate and we should seek out her lost treasure. He also tells us to find our mother's grave, but dies before writing down its location. You must visit your mother's grave. You find it. Ah. This sets us up to spend the next dozen or so hours collecting lots of stuff. Most important are the five chart stones we need in order to find Skull Island. Although, it is right there on the map. You can't just draw an X over it and be like, oh shit, where'd it go? The coming of age angle about us following in our mom's footsteps immediately falls flat because we start the game as the captain of a ship with black sails that fly as the Jolly Roger. We're already at the top of the pirate ladder. There's nowhere else to go. I think what I'm saying is the writer should have kicked Katarina off the ladder. As for the revenge story, it's hollow. By that I mean from the game's opening to its climax, there is no tension or escalation between our hero and villain. Save for one short cutscene where we yell at each other, the bad man fucks off until the end. Technically, he does lead the Crimson Guard pirates we're fighting throughout the game. However, it never felt like we're tearing down his organization. Every enemy respawns, and aside from liberated forts acting as stores, there's no evidence our actions are having any impact. We go through all this trouble finding our mom's treasure, and he finally shows up at the end like he's seen our face on the ESPN. While strategically it makes sense for the bad guy to let the good guy do all the hard work and then try to snatch the reward at the last second, it makes for a very boring story. What I did enjoy about Black Cat and what kept me playing was sailing the Wind Dancer. It has mostly intuitive pick up and play controls where the left stick handles your speed and turning while the right stick moves the camera. Good thing too, because the game starts with us in a 2 to 1 ship battle without a tutorial. There are no aiming reticules or unwanted UI cluttering up the screen. Just point your broadside and fire away. To get a better sense of what your gun crew can see, press any direction on the D-pad to get a first person view for the corresponding part of your ship. If you're prone to motion sickness when playing first person games, this might cause problems for you. 
And since I'm actively showing you footage, I hope you're not pouring your last meal out of your keyboard right now. The Wind Dancer gets its name from being able to summon a gust of wind for increased speed. This is bound to L1 and is effectively an 18th century nitro boost. It does feel a bit like cheating, like we've gone back in time a few hundred years and installed a motor, but this leans into the game's supernatural themes and is critical to the pick up and play action. Speaking of leaning, these ship physics really sell how difficult it is to try and turn at high speeds with what is essentially a floating apartment building. The only part where ship controls flounder is when selecting different cannon shot. You cycle through your arsenal using R1 and R2. The more you collect, the more cumbersome it is to find what you want mid-fight. I should probably give this game a pass for being 20 years old, but I could also point to more popular games from previous generations with better equipment handling. The special cannon ammo has your typical chain shot for shredding... Your choice of special cannon ammo has your typical chain shot for shredding sails to slow opponents. Fire pots so they can burn to death while they drown. Water mines with a hitbox that can only be described as bullshit. My favorite and the ones that add the most strategy are the stink pots. These things make the other crew sick so they can't aim their cannons. And maybe I just like the idea of being able to load a giant fart into a cannon and shooting it a hundred yards at my enemies. Where shit gets wild are magical figureheads. The ram head lets you use the wind gust ability to its full potential. Get out of my way, jerkass! The others let you alter your ship's power shot. The power shot is another ability that recharges over time and fires all cannons at once. Ice was pretty disappointing because it only freezes the enemy until you shoot them again, which is going to be immediately. Lightning is the best because... Bringing the fantasy full circle are the detailed shit models. As you tear ass across the seas, you can purchase larger vessels, and each time I did, I anchored somewhere quiet to zoom in and appreciate the hard work put into the models and textures. Aw, oh, look at the little guy swabbing the decks. So how does this all come together? Quite well, if you ask me. As your arsenal grows, there's a decent number of strategies to choose from. The enemy strength is in its numbers, so I played it safe by luring ships off their patrol route and away from land defenses. Do you say root or route? Just curious, let me know. With tight controls and a conservative use of the wind gust, I outmaneuvered anything they shot at me. As the game progressed, I went up against larger ship classes, so this tactic became essential when I was still saving for the next upgrade. Their AI is smart enough to flee when they're close to sinking, so be careful you don't wind up running into a whole fleet when you chase them. You can repair mid-fight, but if your wind gust ability hasn't recharged, you'll be sunk in seconds. All the tactics and player freedom don't mean shit in the late game, as the islands become boat-sized hallways. This sapped just about all the fun out of the ship combat. The only choice left was to stock up on lumber and repair like mad as I engaged in point-blank range. It's also a shame that the progression to new islands is gated by finding maps and chart stones, as stronger ships and forts could have been used as a natural way to guide players along the intended story path. It would have also allowed folks who like a challenge to take on tougher areas early for greater plunder. I hear some people are keen on this whole player choice sort of thing. I don't know much about that because I'm too busy playing $2 games from the bargain bin. I really wish I could end the review right here. Just give it a bunch of glowing praise, point at some missed potential, and then tell you all to play it any way you can. If I was James Rolfe, this is where I'd take a swig of Rolling Rock. I think a cup of Fave Red's Starburst Jelly Beans will have to do. That's on the floor now. A good 70% of Black Cat's 12-hour runtime is spent exploring the Pirate Isles on foot. Barely any of it feels like it was made with consideration to the sum of its parts. Like, teams of people created dozens of individual assets without consideration to how they'd work together in the game. In fact, writing about it has been incredibly difficult for this very reason. Let's start with how it looks. Each island you see on your map is a sprawling area, often with multiple land masses. At any dock, players can disembark the Wind Dancer and start exploring without having to load. For an early PS2 title, this sounds impressive until you see this comes at the cost of fidelity. The vast, uninteresting environments look as if they should be only viewed from the suspended camera of your ship. I haven't done an environment montage in a while, so how might I let you see for yourself how simple and barren this game's maps are and how dull it is to traverse them?
The motivation for exploring this world is to find things. We're a pirate after all, and what we seek is treasure. Finding it is wholly unrewarding, as doing so requires no problem solving or skill. If a treasure chest isn't already sitting out in the open, Katarina can sniff it out like a gold hunting truffle pig. I smell gold. The controller vibrates in a pulse that gets stronger the closer you get. It's like a game of hot or colder that babysitters play with toddlers. You don't even need to stop running to dig up a chest. Did I mention Katarina has a lofty double jump? If it wasn't clear from the montage, there is no platforming whatsoever. Considering the overall gameplay is finding hundreds of chests, it winds up feeling like a platforming collectathon where you never have to jump. Just, you know, Mario 64, but there's no pits, no hazards, no swimming, no puzzles. Just a straight run to the stars and bosses. If I've chosen the right footage, you will have no doubt noticed I'm not stopping to fight. This is because, like the treasure hunting, I felt no pleasure in doing it. For one, the environments are so simple and open, there's plenty of room to outmaneuver them. Enemies are spawned in small groups, usually amongst a clump of trees, to obscure the fact everyone unattractively rises out of the ground. They then wander aimlessly until Katarina steps over an invisible line, at which point they run straight at her. That is unless we're talking about the Yetis. Those guys just fucking yell at you. The fighting in Black Cat suffers from a death of a thousand cuts. Katarina has a sword with which she can block, do a four-hit combo, and unleash a recharging power attack. She does find new swords that add an extra charge to the power attack, but the block and four-hit combo is all the complexity sword fighting has for the whole adventure. There is no lock-on or dodge, so you wind up standing still to fight. Enemies swarm you and don't respect the kung fu circle. Both Cat and the baddies are knocked back, even when blocking, which usually results in missing your parry or your follow-up attack. I found it best to delay my button presses to avoid the combo altogether, and even this only works if it's a one-on-one -on -one fight. Fighting pirates like this is a slog, and fighting anything else requires you get lucky or use one of your throwable items. You aim with Katarina and not the camera. Like the Wind Dancer, you cycle through your throwables with the shoulder buttons, and I've already gone over how cumbersome that is. There is some auto-aim, which seems to vary between items, but still no lock-on. Since enemies run straight at you, it's difficult to do any of this without cheesing the AI by standing outside their invisible line. And if I'm gonna do that, why not run past them and skip fighting altogether? These guys are nice enough to teleport right behind me, so I don't even have to stop running. These statues, though? These statues can go to fucking hell. But alas, try as I might, there are times I had to fight a boss or kill enemies to unlock a gate. The best items in Katarina's arsenal are bottles and statues. These only require that you kite enemies into a group and press a button. And since I ran past everything else, I was usually at full capacity for these. My heart goes out to the persons who spent dozens if not hundreds of hours collectively spent bringing this Viking warrior to life. You dare to challenge me? <laughs> and this demon. This right here, spoilers, this is the final boss. And he's dead. To give credit where it's due, this lava boss was a genuine challenge, but mostly because of cumbersome controls. Same goes for this witch doctor boss that, um... Yeah, this game has some stuff that doesn't fly for 2022. Despite my glowing praise for ship combat, I can't recommend you play through the campaign to experience it. And thankfully, you don't have to. There's a versus mode called Sea Battle, which lets you control ships you won't find in the campaign. You can play against a human or the computer in three different game modes. Quick is your standard 1v1 deathmatch. Ladder is like reverse gun game, where you respawn with a larger class of ship each time you're sunk. I personally recommend you try Fleet and choose a lower to mid-tier level ship for a good challenge. I think there's a story to be told here about Pirates the Legend of Black Cat. Westwood Studios was known for its talent, and their skill shines bright when sailing the Wind Dancer. I would very much love to sit down with someone who worked on this game to learn about the unfortunate circumstances that led to what feels like a rushed product. I was so excited after the game's first 20 minutes, I thought I had found a new favorite. But not even halfway through, I was wondering if I should cut my losses and move on to something else. I have every intention of challenging friends to a sea battle, but otherwise, this is staying on the shelf. Thanks for watching.
holy crap, uh, I forgot this game had the best ever pirate theme for the shop music. 10 out of 10, greatest game of all time. 